Today, we're going to be talking about the eight passenger situation, which I know has been kind of wrapped up, but I've been out of the scene for a little bit and we'll talk about why that is at the end of the video here. But there's still some things coming out, such as Kevin Frankie filing a lawsuit against Jody Hildebrand and a lot of things that I missed, such as the Kevin Frankie police interview, the prison phone calls between Ruby and Kevin, Ruby's journal that she kept, and we're going to be going over Ruby and Jody's arrest as well as their interview and Paige Hannah side of the story and if you're unsure of what's going on in the eight passenger situation I've covered multiple videos that go over the situation so please go back and watch those before you watch this one also it's been a while since I've uploaded a video so please engage with this video leave a like leave a comment down below that'll help this get out to more people and help spread some awareness with it and I wanted to start out this video from Kevin Frankie's perspective because it seems like he didn't know any of this was going on and a lot of the stuff that was going on when he was in like the men's group or the things that Ruby and Jody were saying he found bizarre as well but he was convinced that it was all God speaking and he had to follow through with these things because he was a bad husband and it really sheds a light on when you see Ruby and Jody getting arrested the kind of people they really are because Jody tries to play innocent and Ruby is just acting annoyed like this is stupid all of them are stupid she just doesn't talk the whole time and it's just it's so bizarre and you can truly see that Ruby believes that God has her back in all this and that she just believes that the devil is after her she's got these crazy delusions that has led her to do some evil things. Now, from my understanding, Kevin was tipped off by somebody he won't name during the interview. They ask him and they ask, how did he know to come pick up these kids? It's a name he won't give, but he said he got a received a phone call to come pick them up. And when he showed up there, they ended up interviewing him. And in the interview, he says that he hasn't seen any of the kids for over a year and only briefly met with Ruby to sign some documents to sign over for some investments that were being made that Ruby uh, needed. So are they all living with you or? No, I haven't seen them for over a year. Any of them? No, none of them. For a year? Over a year. Okay. I've been in a separation. From who? From my wife and family. What's your wife's name? Ruby. Ruby. When was the last time you saw Ruby? The last time I saw her yeah. was the 18th of, of this month. We met to, she requested me to sign over vehicles or the titles to the vehicles, the vehicle that she drives that were all in my name. Now, if this is true and he really hasn't seen the kids in over a year and has only briefly met with Jody, you can only imagine how that might feel whenever you find out what has happened to the kids, which I'm sure most of you know. I don't have to go into detail. It's really, really bad. I saw the pictures online. It's it's just it's so bad and it's really, really sad. Have you been since separated or since they lived here in the city of Ivins? Um, have you communicated with your wife regarding like discipline with your kids or their care or their physical well-being? No. So is she doing this on her own and just telling you how your kids are? She's not telling me anything about the kids. So here you can see that the interviewers are trying to figure out what he knows. They're trying to dig in and they dig a little deeper and deeper and start asking him things about Jody. And it turns out he says that he respects Jody and what they are doing with connections. He listens to their podcast every day. Who's this, who's this uh, female Jody that your wife was with? Do you, do you know a female named Jody? She is a... A therapist and a life coach, I know, and she's... Do you respect her? Uh, do I respect her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think she's a very honest, truthful person, yes. Okay. And that's typically the theme with Jody is that a lot of these men would respect her and their lives would get ruined because of it, because they would take her opinions and value them and listen to her to her fullest. And then you see this occurring pattern throughout the interview where Kevin says that he has no idea what is going on with the children. He wasn't in the picture. So are you aware of how she disciplines the kids or how she handles 
No. Do kids with behavioral issues or anything like that? No. So you're, you're unaware of how she does that? Yes. Okay. Are you aware of the physical condition of your children? No. No. I'm, I've chosen to trust my wife with the children. That was part of the agreement of our separation. So according to Kevin, again, he had no idea of what was going on and his only role in the family was to provide financial support while he was away. As far as I know, there was no evidence that supported that he was part of the situation and had anything to do with it but things can always change. And this next part I find interesting because the interviewers are asking him about his YouTube channel and the comments talking about the potential bad things that were going on in the family home. And it's interesting to hear it from his perspective, it just being like a thing that kind of got blown out of proportion. Basically it boils down to he was being um, very cruel and mean to his siblings that he shared a room with. And so we removed him from the room. And we said, you can sleep anywhere you want. Sleep on the couch, sleep on the pull-out bed, sleep on the floor for all we care, but you're not sleeping in that room with your brother. It definitely feels like he's trying to downplay this a little bit because there's more things that happen than just this situation. And his idea of cruel and bad is just Chad playing a prank on his little brother saying that they were going to go to Disneyland, but they weren't really going. So it all boils down to whatever your perception of Kroll is. And in this situation, I guess that's his. Maybe there's more things that happen that we just don't know about. But we do know that their family was pretty strict in how they did things towards their kids. So... There's that. And Chad Frankie actually did a live stream not too long ago talking about the situation, answering a lot of questions that were coming in. And the beanbag situation was one of them that came up as well as the bathroom door being removed, removing all privacy from when he needed to use the restroom. Obviously, you need that privacy for obvious reasons. I don't think I have to state why, but that's pretty messed up. That's a pretty messed up thing to do to a kid that's like, what, how old was he? Like 15, 16, something like that. Trying to use the bathroom, gets his door removed. At the time, he didn't think it was a bad thing until later on, he realized that that's pretty bizarre. That's a weird punishment to remove the bathroom door. Now, I can understand the bedroom door. I've actually had a friend that uh, his parents did that to him. They removed his bedroom door, but the, not the bathroom door. That's uh, that's a little too extreme. And it's a pattern that is with the Frankies. They do these extreme punishments, such as not feeding their kids, which is really, really bizarre. I slept on a beanbag for seven months, and I honestly enjoyed it. Honestly, it's not that bad. Because I honestly believe that it was like the right thing you guys gotta like i don't think anyone really understands the brainwash behind it everything my mom taught i thought was true up until a couple weeks after the arrest that's just how it was and i think that's how it was for everyone I had my bathroom door taken off because they didn't want me to have any privacy so i mean and even though i was like 15 16 like i'm still a kid and i still listen and I try to like look up to my parents and listen to them, or my mom specifically and Jody. So I just thought like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. I wasn't even against it, kind of crazy. And when it comes to your parents, it's only natural to trust them. You want to trust them, you want their love. It's something that you are yearning for, at least that's how it was for me. And when you're put in these situations or you see these situations where these children are being misled and brainwashed, then you get situations like this. And it's really sad to see that when when parents aren't taking and raising their kids properly they are just conditioning them into their belief systems that aren't suitable for society as a whole and you just get some really bad outcomes and then kevin goes on to explain why he was away from his family for so long and it was because he needed space which this goes into more detail in the audio version of the interview that we're going to get into we'll dive a little bit deeper into that but for now it was because he had addictions that he needed to take care of and he needed space for that now kevin frankie's reaction to him being told about what's happening with his children feels like a pretty genuine reaction that a father should have uh, from a father that cares about their children now that's not to say he didn't do anything bad or there was wasn't anything that 
happened behind the scene that we don't know about or maybe he didn't do anything bad at all it, from his reaction i get the impression that this is something that is really really hurting him it hurt him to hear this and it's hard for him to believe that ruby would do this because he trusted ruby they had a good connection jody helped him uh, get closer with her at least that's what he thought and then all of this just happens out of nowhere kind of blindsides him and Chad because they were trusting of everything that was going on. They didn't think anything bad was happening. They were just a family living in a house that had their rules and their punishments in which these punishments were pretty extreme. It was normal to them, sadly. Well, you're the, you're the custodial parent of these children. I don't see why we can't explain to you what, why we were involved. So I don't recall the exact time, but sometime before 11 o'clock today, we received uh, a phone call from 911 on our dispatch that uh, a 12 to 13 year old boy was knocking on doors in the neighborhood asking for food and water, that he was severely emaciated, that he had what is emaciated? A skinny, scrawny, uh, malnutritioned, not enough food, not enough water to sustain life. So he had I'm sorry, what? He had duct tape on his extremities, on his hands, on his ankles, and those were covering rope burns that were used to tie him down. Take a second and think about what I just said. That's the condition of your son. So you can see him here with what looks like a genuine reaction. And when they leave the room, he looks like he is trying to process everything he just heard. Which is not the same reaction we get out of Ruby when we see her getting arrested, who just looks annoyed. And then when they come back in the room, he can be seen to what looks like to be visibly crying and talks about how he feels about the situation. And it's just really sad to see. What's going to happen? It's my wife. I love my wife. I don't know. I'm being honest with you. I don't know. I don't know charges against my wife. Possibly. But I love that wife and I trust that wife. And so, I mean, this feels like getting run over by a steam truck while you're sharing with me today. Yeah. You, I can tell you're caught off guard. I thought I was just coming here to pick up my kids. And for what, I don't know what or why, but... So you can see that he thought he was just showing up to pick up his kids. Getting hit with something like this is definitely feeling like he described getting hit by a steam truck. And who knows what his uh, insight on it now might be. I think he's definitely understanding the evil that has happened because he's even trying to sue Jody Hildebrandt for the all the damage he has caused, psychological damage he's caused to the children. And he filed for divorce on November 23rd after Ruby was first charged with a felony. You realize that I have a picture of my family on my wall and I look at it every day and I work, I work every day so I can back to my family and save my family and everything you're sharing to me just sounds like a made up story like I I have no idea what you're talking about like It's just, it sounds like a horror movie. Yes, it definitely does seem and feel like a nightmare, especially with the more and more we kept learning throughout this whole investigation. And even with all of the interviews, it still seems to unravel more and more insights and things that we just do not know or have not known. But we are getting a better understanding of what is going on here and from that, we're going to move into the Kevin Frankie second police interview where it's audio only 
And we're going to take a deeper look into that. And in this interview, he talks about one interesting piece of evidence that has yet to be released to the public, and that is the pen papers. Now, this notebook was filled with hundreds of pages of Ruby's visions and her interactions with Jody and Pam. And Ruby believed that this wouldn't be read until she wouldn't write the stuff she wrote in the pen paper. She would not write in her journal. The stuff she wrote in the pen papers was not intended to be read by anybody until God would decree them to be written as scripture for the whole world to read. Okay. So you can see how crazy that sounds, but that is what Ruby believed. And it seems that the police do have this and maybe it will be released like uh, Ruby's journal was released. We'll just have to wait and see. And then there's the question of who is Pam Bodcher and what does she have to do with all of this? She was having visions with uh, Ruby and Jody. They would all go into a room together and come out feeling like they were on cloud nine. This is what Kevin said. And she was also mentioned when Ruby was saying her sentencing statement. She apologized to him saying, I'm sorry, I let you down. It's hard to believe that she didn't know that these kids were down there being treated this way. But until evidence comes forward, maybe there's something in the pen papers. I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that too. And then from here, Kevin goes on to explain the situation of everything that happened leading up to the events of the kids being found. It all started in the fall of 2020 when the Hannahs convinced Ruby and Kevin to join Connections and convinced them to come to a conference. She invited me to go to a, um, it was like a conference or something held at Thanksgiving Point. Um, in Lehigh, and there were like a hundred people there, and that was in the fall of 2019, um, maybe late summer of 2019, late summer, late summer 2019. And my impression at that time was this is this is absolute craziness. This is a bunch of man-hating women that are just looking for excuses to you know, tear down their husbands and. I mean, that's what it felt like to me when I was in there. And then he goes on to say that it was a confusing situation because there were people on the stage like the Hannahs that he respected that were giving speeches, mic in hand, and he just didn't know what to take from it because he was getting mixed signals here. And then eventually he ends up going on a trip with the Hannahs, him and Ruby, and it felt like just a trip to convince him to join Connections. The trip wasn't for fun. It was just to... It had a plan. They had a plan to convince him to join. And then the question arises, who is the Hannahs? Where did they even come from? So it turns out the Hannahs were investors into the Connections program. They liked the Connections program and what it stood for, according to Paige Hanna. But until they, it was when they started seeing the evil side of Jody, that's kind of when they pulled out of everything and regretted the decision of uh, telling Ruby about connections. And I think that Paige might feel like it's a little bit her fault because she recently released a video talking about the situation and it seems like she's gonna release it in parts and here's that video. This video is named The First and it's on a YouTube channel called Under the Rug. And this is Paige Hannah here and she goes on to talk about how it all began. Hi, my name's Paige Hannah. Um, I'm married to Johnny Hannah. I have eight kids, I live in Utah and uh, I am a former colleague to Jody Hildebrandt and former friend and business partner to Ruby Frankie. This video has been a long time coming. Um, for years, I've wanted to share my experience with connections and have not known how or when. Um, and no, it's time. I, I definitely know that my name, my husband's name has been put on the radar through Kevin Frankie. Um, and some misconceptions he's had and would like the opportunity to share my experience um, in its entirety uh, to offer a bridge to a lot of um, pieces that are that are not connecting. I've already been accused of being the source of all of this pain that's been caused because I 
initially was the introduction um, of connections to Ruby. Oh, this isn't going to be easy. This isn't something that I uh, take any joy in sharing. It's been really difficult the last six months understanding what uh, those Frankie children have been through. Especially with the knowledge that um, I tried to warn Ruby and she not only didn't listen, but told me um, that I was lying and It has been very painful uh, understanding that, that she was already that controlled. Um, so yes, it does seem like she was the initial bridge to Jody and Ruby, but in the end she regrets it. That's what it looks like anyways, because of the outcome. She goes on to say that she met Jody initially by taking a class from her. And even when she was taking that class, she noticed a, kind of darkness in in Jody. In which she says that Jody was masterful at controlling people, manipulating people and bringing them in to fix a problem that they have. It just takes the desire to become a better person and somebody to come and manipulate it. So whether you just want the approval of a, a boss or a pastor or a friend that you think is better than you, or you perceive as on a pedestal, you are in danger of dropping your own character and integrity to appease that other person. And that's what Jody was masterful at. That I can see from my 2024 perspective, but my 2018 perspective was very naive and just, this is so good, this is so helpful. We, I have some tools that will help my family and oh look it is helping my family so i think it could help your family too so for her she was in a very naive state as she says and she was easily manipulated into believing that this was helping and to her it was it was helping for a little bit until she started seeing these little signs here and there from jody and the way she was uh, treating people she wasn't treating them with compassion she was just showing a lot of hate towards the uh, evilness that was inside them instead of compassion towards them and she just wasn't treating them properly she was treating them like she was the superior and you better listen to me or you're you're gone you're lost you're evil and that's where you can see how kevin was confused when he was seeing the hannahs up there on the stage people that were his friends saying all this stuff when he was getting you know some uh-oh feelings like this is not a good group but there's people up there that i respect so maybe there's more to it than i'm you know than i'm seeing over time i recognize that jody purposely put herself on a pedestal not just so you would see her as a god, but because she believed she was a god. Um, I, I know it's evident how narcissistic she is, but, but truly, um, to the nth degree, narcissistic, and uh, was masterful with the manipulation, was masterful with... Um, carefully laying the steps for you to desire what she was teaching and then to desire to please her. I was still in that state of like, this is good. This is, this has really helped me when I met Ruby in 2018. And, um, and thought it would benefit her life. Um, she had told me she wanted to change some of the parenting things that she was doing and um, needed more help with patience and, and understanding and compassion and, um, and I really thought it would help so from the sounds of it, maybe Ruby was actually listening to some of these comments she was getting on her YouTube channel talking about her parenting style and she wanted to seek help on how to fix it. And unfortunately, she found the wrong person for that that convinced her into this 
evil way of caring for your children. She then goes on to say that she just wants to leave it there for now and she'll release uh, more videos and parts because it's she's going to get really emotional talking about the rest of it and uh, she just needs some time. So now that we know who the Hennas are, we can go back to the Kevin Frankie interview where he left off on joining the men's group after he went on that trip with the Hannahs when they convinced him to join Connections. And while he was in this men's group, it actually helped him. He felt like he thought things were going good. He was connecting with people. His marriage was getting better. Everything was improving in his life. And a little bit before this, Ruby and Kevin's YouTube channel was losing a lot of money from getting canceled for the things that they were doing with their children and people were worried. So it impacted their channel greatly. And Ruby was in distraught because of this and sought support and validation in Jody. And through that, Jody gained a lot of trust. And then Kevin ends up being the guy on the stage talking about how this is one of the best groups he's ever joined and that he thought it was all crazy at first, but he's actually seeing results in his marriage and that everyone should do it. But things began to take a really dark turn when Jody started seeing shadow figures, as she called them. We went out to like a dinner afterwards. And that's where Jody really opened up to the women in a private conversation that she believed she was being tormented and haunted by shadow figures every night. And um, <laughs> that was spooky. And then this is when the Hannahs drove down to try to help Jody. And according to Kevin, they were trying to introduce her into a new cult leader, in his words. And there were some other strange things that happened. There's two sides to this story, and it's hard to know what is true, but this is what I believe that uh, Paige Hannah was talking about, some misinformation going out. But you never know what the truth is in these kind of situations. You just have two sides to the coin. They, the Hannahs drove down from Mapleton and picked Jody up and brought her back to their home in Mapleton. And she lived for six weeks in that home in Mapleton. And this is where, like, I don't know what happened, but I do know that there's two different sides of stories. They tried to introduce her to a new cult lady that the Hannahs were getting into. So they wanted to merge their cults into one, apparently. And um, they refer to it as a cult for the time? Oh, no. Or no no one in a cult says, I'm in a cult. A cult. <laughs> right. I was wondering. But from your perspective, it looks like two cult leaders merging together. From where I stand now? Absolutely. Um, according to Jody, she was held against her will for six weeks and was kidnapped, and she escaped and got out. According to the Hannahs, after six weeks of Jody stabbing herself with forks and knives, cutting herself and um, wanting to commit suicide and trying to seduce the husband of the family, they kicked her out. So when it comes to that story, I'm a little bit more inclined to believe the latter there because... I mean, it seems like Jody, something that Jody would do, it's really extreme. So it's hard for someone to really believe it, especially when they see Jody in such a good lie on a pedestal. So it can make somebody, it can make it difficult for somebody that looks up to her to see that as the truth. And we all know that Jody is crazy but that doesn't mean she did it but i'm just saying like she probably did it and then jody went back home and that is when she reached out to ruby for help ruby and kevin went down and seen jody and while they were there kevin said he saw dishes flying off the shelves hitting hitting against the wall things he couldn't explain or hearing loud crashes in the basement just crazy things that he thought he would never experience because he said that he was a pretty smart guy a logical guy he thinks logically and that th this stuff he just couldn't explain eventually after a few months of going over there and seeing her and trying to take care of her there was a bishop that was seeing jody and this bishop would go there like every day and stay for four hours a day eventually the bishop was exhausted and said he couldn't do this anymore there needed to be a resolution and that was when 
Kevin was convinced to let Jody come stay with him, him and Ruby. At first, he didn't want to do it. He was reluctant. He said he didn't want to be anywhere near this stuff because this is just craziness. And Ruby convinced him by saying, don't be selfish. She's done so much for our family. And then he was like, well, OK, this could be like a fun little vacation thing for Jody and all of them to kind of experience and let loose but it was when she arrived there that things got even weirder for kevin the moment she showed up in my house just the weirdest crap started happening lights turning on and off said sounds of people walking in walls and like sounds like footprints going up walls and across the, the ceiling and then like stuff floating around and, and it was just it was weird and I hated it and I became the resident exorcist that was the title I came up with myself I thought it was kind of funny but it was my job to like go and give her <coughs> lessons whenever she started to like go into a trance and, and go into possession and which started to be a lot and Ruby would go up and check on her it started like four every four hours at night and then it moved every two hours at night and it moved every hour at night and then at some point Ruby said you know what I'm just going to start sleeping in there and, and if I need you I'll come down and get you I'm like, that's kind of weird but okay and and that was that she they started sleeping in the same bed ruby sleeping in the same bed as jody it definitely makes me a little suspicious of what was really going on there because there was some circumstances throughout this whole ordeal where there would be some signs of something more going on besides a platonic relationship and even chad frankie ruby frankie's son said that he thought that his mom might have been lesbian do you think Jody's a lesbian? Yeah, I do. I honestly do. That's my personal opinion. We don't claim Jody. Thank you, Isabella Cat. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> she never, ever, ever came out and said that she was a lesbian, but I just, I think based off of hers and my mom's behavior, it, yeah, I, I agree. And then it turns into a complete 180 for Kevin where things were going great, but then things just started not going good at all jody starts going into these trances where she thinks she's going to heaven seeing god talking to god and then pam ruby and jody were all going into a room together and they would be in there for four hours or longer and come out on cloud nine saying they were having profound experiences and they would tell kevin when the time is right and then there was one instance where kevin was watching the kids and chad had some friends over in the backyard and jody didn't like that and she used that as a reason to get kevin out of the house because it was at that point that they were trying to that jody was trying to create space with from kevin and ruby that's what it looked like anyways and she would slowly implement rules to where Kevin couldn't go to the second floor or Kevin had to ask to come home at a certain time if he left. And eventually it just turned into Kevin just leaving for good so he could go work on some issues he was dealing with with his P addiction. And that was when Ruby was trying to just sign everything over to Jody. She wanted to sign over her whole YouTube channel to Jody. Even their YouTube manager was saying, This is crazy. Don't do this. This screams manipulation, scam. And they and, and Ruby ended up firing her YouTube manager over it. It was then that the whole dynamic changed for Kevin. And when he would go back to the men's group where he felt like he was connecting with everybody and making progress, it was like they were all turned against him and at any time jody would say something negative towards kevin the whole group would attack him like a pack of dogs and kevin says it was psychological hell and it seemed like no matter what kevin did he was told that he was being manipulative lying and jody said she talked to god and just couldn't understand why he wasn't making any progress and he just needed to separate himself from everybody and work on himself 100% full time, which to me screens manipulation. She wanted Kevin out of the picture so she could have complete total control over Ruby and just rain terror on 
her whole life and do these evil things that she does. Now in the interview, it, it is said that Jody never shows up to these meetings on camera. She would do, I guess, webinars and in replace of her camera, it would just be an X for the connections, but she never showed herself. And they got onto the topic of, well, why doesn't she show herself? And it was because apparently she had a lot of cuts where she was cutting herself, I guess, on her arms. But if this is true, this relays back to what Paige Hanna said about Jody cutting herself. They were having these group meetings. She would never show up. She would show up on the WebEx, but in place of her person, would just be this X for the connection. So it's like this Wizard of Oz thing going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She never kind of, showed her face. Kind of she her face. she yeah. always covered herself. Yeah. Like even in the hottest of summer, she would wear these hoodies. She would smell so bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She would never bathe. And, but she was trying to hide her arms and stuff because apparently Ruby told me they were just like mutilated. The other thing that I think it's important for them to know is during that whole time when you were out, <coughs> you had communication with Ruby maybe three or four times, but yeah. each time, or at least on some of the occasions you spoke to her, she's telling you that everything's blissful, we're doing well, you know, everything's so much better without you. And oh, well, that would be communicated to me by Jody every week okay. and the men's groups too, and it was just like, you're abandoning your family. You're, and, and it always hurts so bad because it's like, I want to be with my family so bad. What do you mean I'm abandoning them? If you wanted to be with your family, you would change. You would stop being selfish. You would, but you keep being selfish, so you want it. And it was just felt like, well, how do I stop wanting it then? It's like, then you must change. Well, how do I change? Well, you got to want it. Well, how <laughs> what you know so how do i want it you got to change it's just like perpetual cycle yeah and there's no i tried to find my way into that cycle and, and it felt like have you ever had a dream where there's like a problem you're trying to solve but you can't solve it and how frustrating you feel that's what my life felt like and as I'm looking back and I'm realizing there was no solution. It was, there was, you either had Jody's approval or you didn't. There, I wasn't doing anything different than the other men in the group. But they got her approval, so they were praised and they were repenting and they were doing everything right. I, on the other hand, was manipulative and selfish and enabling and all blah, 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 blah. And, she became like the arbiter of, of truth, the arbiter of forgiveness, God's own mouthpiece, and it, it was just messed up. It's important to know all the little details within this interview that can help paint a better picture. So if you are interested in this, please go watch the interview. There's still some things that I didn't fully cover, such as the visions. There's a little bit more in the vision, the visions that Jody was having, such as her talking in weird voices, thinking that she was being possessed and saying that she was Satan's bride. Just really weird things that she would try to do to convince the Frankies of what, what she was doing there. Ruby was completely convinced by all of this. She was trying to give Jody everything that she owned. She was taking money out of her kid's bank account and doing I don't know what with it, but they found it in the house when they were searching it and amongst some other things as well. And on top of that, Jody was getting $900 a month from Chad Frankie just for therapy which is insane and i think it's important to include here chad's thoughts on his dad kevin frankie as well if, if anyone blames kevin for anything they have the story completely wrong like this was a ruby and jody thing i had no idea the abuse was going on when i moved out anyone in our family anybody if you ask anyone can um, all say that kevin had no idea about the abuse but you also got to remember that all of us were working with Jody at this time, and we were all in support of Ruby and Jody, but we did not know what they were doing behind doors. I, I hate when people 
try to dissect it when the real people that know are the ones that were actually there. Even when there's evidence that says that he clearly wasn't aware of anything, I wish people would just <laughs> look at the facts, you know? I mean, I was in support at first when I heard everything, so I just didn't understand that I was in denial. I know he was too. See, I can understand how you would be in denial after something like that. These are people that you trusted. These are people that were setting the rules for you. People that you looked up to had a lot of status in a certain area of life and you trusted them. You're not going to just all of a sudden start trusting all these other sources whenever your whole reality is in this certain area. Now it's going to take some evidence and some facts and eventually you'll be persuaded the other way like they were. But I totally understand where they're coming from and I'm glad that they were able to see the truth and not be consumed by you know the delusions that were going on there so far we went over two of kevin frankie's interviews and chad's response to the situation now i would like to move over into ruby frankie's journal and take a deeper look at what she was writing down while all of this was going on and in this journal we're going to go over the parts that stand out the most here and we're going to talk about them so in one instance on 6 30 23 r refuses to do wall sit-ups he says he is done and then on 7 1 23 r is to stay outside sleep outside only and then it's cut off there to the bathroom i think it might say come inside to the bathroom i don't know and shower then it says E refuses to work, screams, has hair shaved off. R runs away around 1.15 a.m. Ruby finds him at 3.14 a.m. I think we can all agree that having to sleep outside, only coming in to use the bathroom and shower and getting your hair shaved off for doing something that you shouldn't be doing according to them is a really cruel way of punishment. And it seems like they tried to escape once before this, but ended up getting caught, which I'm sure was not a good feeling and then she just has a disgusting comment about r turning 12 tomorrow and he's using the bathroom on himself and she's calling it satanic choices it's just it's it's unsettling to see i don't want to read that one fully she says it's r's birthday and he doesn't even know what month it is e and r have been in so much deviant behavior they won't control their bodily functions what kind of person talks about their kids like that writes it down tells them things like that it's just i mean we know what kind of person after seeing everything and it's important that we know this because it gives you a real insight on these kinds of people because there is evil in the world and it's usually right in front of us and sometimes we can try to hide from it but it's good to be aware of it because it can help help more people the deeper i get into this it's just her talking really bad about her kids and trying to keep control of them and it's it's not a good read and i don't feel comfortable really going over the whole thing but if you want to check it out there will be a link down in the description for anybody that wants to uh, become aware of this situation and honestly i thought i could go over it but i didn't realize before going over it in detail of the things that she was saying and it's hard for me to read and I know that reading this online, it's going to be hard for you. So I want to leave it to those that want to expose themselves to that to be able to go and look at it. Now we're going to move on to the Ruby and Kevin Frankie gel phone call. And please see the truth. I know it's obscured. Where I see the facts, I see the truth. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm gathering. Right off the bat, it's just, it's disturbing that she thinks she's in the right still she's delusional she believes what she has done is the right thing it's not adults have a really hard time understanding that children can be full of evil and what that takes to fight it well she's calling her children evil there and it's a little worrisome to me that kevin isn't really saying anything to kind of fight back on this i don't know at what point this is if he's still kind of like questioning everything that's going on i noticed a lot of people in the comments were saying things like the way he was reacting to the situation made him look complicit and i don't know if you can't blame somebody without evidence so it's important not to blame an innocent man 
he probably was still consumed by the delusions who knows but as as of where we stand there is no evidence that suggests that he did anything bad him the kids going back to him i hope that they are in a safe environment and i hope that nothing bad happens and then ruby goes on to say some more bizarre things like the devil has been after her for years and that the kids shouldn't have been hospitalized for as long as they were they're going to be in the hospital for three days so weird it's just not necessary they're trying to exaggerate this now if you've seen the photos of these children you know that what she is saying right there is 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 just screaming something's wrong with her because those kids looked like they needed to stay in there long like for weeks it was it's bad it's just scary that people like this exist to be so delusional that you let it get this far it's just and of course people like this don't believe it's their fault ruby believes that she's just misunderstood and blames satan for all of this and even at one point compares herself to a prophet well they didn't show me any pictures or anything with the way they described it it was very serious if he hasn't seen any pictures yet then his reaction is a little bit more suitable if it was my kids i would be freaking out um, but he, I think he's holding on to hope. He just wants his wife back. He wants to believe that they're not these things that they're telling him. And I think that might be a typical reaction of somebody that cares for other people or cares for somebody else like their wife. But the most upsetting thing is that I am completely misunderstood. That is the most horrible feeling. Like my own family misunderstands me. They misinterpret me. And, and poor Jody, they, they misinterpret her. They misunderstand her. She puts her neck out on the line for people and then they get mad at her. I mean, it's like at some point, if people are misunderstanding you, then you would think that maybe you're the problem. God told me. God told me when I was driving before I called you. I didn't have any information. I didn't know anything. And the Spirit said, your children are going to be removed. And I just, I cried out loud. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not ready. And God told me I'm done. And I, I just, oh, Satan has taken everything oh, away from me that I love. And I'm a good woman. I don't do naughty things. I don't do naughty things. I cringe when I hear that. Those were some of the key moments that I found to be important for this video. If you would like to watch that whole thing, I'll have the link in the description. But now we're going to move on to Ruby getting arrested and how she reacts in the uh, interview room. So this is when they're in the house and Ruby's getting arrested. And you can see throughout this whole ordeal that she has no emotion on her face. I mean, she even looks annoyed and agitated by all of this. You can even tell she looks a little angry when she's just looking at the officer and she's being read everything. She, ne she never responds either, and verbally anyways. She doesn't hold any full conversations. Even the officers make a slight comment about the interaction. She is definitely not a talker. She not? No. Are you going to ask her a name okay. or just like, let me ask about things. She looks at me and goes, I know. What's up? What's up? What's that? What's up? I know. Just... Really? Yeah, I'm very curious. And then just watch how she's reacting to them asking her questions so i know i introduced myself to you earlier but my name is detective Bates, and this is sergeant tobler we're just here to talk to you about kind of a few things involving your kids so first are you do you live down here or or do you live up north So it pretty much goes on like that. She just has this stare on her face. And after knowing everything that we know now, looking at that face, it's 
pretty terrifying. And this next reaction, I feel like stands out a little bit more because the way Ruby just stares blankly at the police officer, it's unsettling. Score, so you're under arrest. It's going to be two counts, second degree felony of child abuse or neglect, okay? Do you understand that or no? Are you okay? I'm wondering if there's like a medical clearance that needs to, like, do, do you need medical attention before you go to the jail? No. Okay. Have you ever been arrested before? I'm just concerned about you. I know you don't believe that. But I've had an opportunity to talk to your husband and kind of worried about your circumstances and Obviously, your children as well. Her blank stare off into the distance, I feel like, speaks a thousand words. It's very scary, especially with everything we know now. Now, obviously, she doesn't have to speak if she doesn't want to, but it's just the things that we know now and looking at her and the aura she gives off, it gives you this unsettling feeling. Now we're going to move on to Jody's body cam and interview, and there's definitely some interesting things I saw when watching it that I would like to talk about. And it's important to keep in mind when you're watching Jody that she is a master manipulator. She thinks that she can get her way out of anything that she does. Narcissism plays a role here. And it's interesting to see her say certain things, maybe in hopes of she thinks she's going to get out of it. And it's interesting to see that she knew that this was coming. She answers the door saying, I have my attorney on the phone. Jody, I need you to step out. I have, I have my attorney. That's great. Step out of the house. No, I'm not going to step out of the house. Step out of the house. House. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're just gonna whoa, whoa, whoa. Gonna be Wait a minute, how do you come to my house? Right so she's in full panic mode at this moment. She's like thinking, oh my God, they're going in my house. They're going to see everything that we've done. And this is not good. And then the whole time she's playing dumb, acting like she doesn't know what's going on. And it's, it's annoying to watch. I'll be honest. There's a what's that? There's only I'm saying there's another person there's not. Okay. I find it interesting why she says there's only one person in the house when they had two kids in there. One of them escaped. I think she knew that. And so she was trying to play it off like, well, there's only one here. And maybe she thought she could get out of it by playing that card. I don't know. I don't know what goes through her head. And she mentions this a few times throughout the interaction. She says that there's no one else in the house. There's only a girl in the house. There's no boy in the house. And then on top of all of this, while all of this is going on inside the house, all this craziness, all these really bad things, she's renting out the other side of her house as an Airbnb. So there's people that are staying next door or just in the little other area of the house while she's got these kids in those rooms. I have Airbnb guests over there. Probably scared them to death. Okay. It's interesting how she's worried about the Airbnb guests, but isn't even worried about the children that are in the house. And there's one point when she says, I see your position. That's why I'm crying. This is sad. I wonder what she was trying to do there. Is she trying to pull on the heartstrings of the police officers? Is she just trying to talk her way out of it again? What was the point in that statement? Because she's the one that caused all of this. She's 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 partners with Ruby and they both work together to cause all of this. So what is the point in her saying that? And the only thing I can think of is that she's just trying to not look like the bad guy here. And another thing that was brought up is the safe door. She was asked for the code for the safe door, but she acted like she didn't know it. Now, maybe she didn't know it, but it's piques my interest because I wonder if she was actually trying to keep him out for whatever reason, because she had some stuff in there. I don't know. And while she's in the interview room, she says, I'm a little nervous and she definitely should be. And it's obvious why she is nervous. She knows everything that she's done. She knows she's screwed. I'm a little nervous. You're that, you know, to be honest with you, if I was sitting over there, I'd be a little nervous too. So don't, don't worry about it. We're just here to talk. And the whole time they're talking to her, they're trying to get her to answer questions, but she tries to act like the good person and says, well, my attorney's saying I shouldn't talk. I want to talk, but I just don't want my words flipped on me and stuff like that. And she just 
keeps trying to portray herself as a good person and it's something that i see a pattern with her with all these interactions throughout the whole thing we just need to clarify and i know and i'd love to tell you if he were here because i don't know i i don't i don't know what's going to happen with what i say you know i i watched i'm a psychologist i've watched people flip things all the time so I get it. Yeah, she watches people flip things all the time, like herself. This is something that she does, and that's why she's very cautious of it. And I hope that this video helped you understand that and helped you see them in the light that they are really in the type of people they really are i know we all knew that they were not good people but for me lining it up that way and looking at it that way really helped me understand this a lot better and i will be keeping an eye on the videos that Paige hannah releases and for any of the videos i showed here i'll be having them linked in the description below so if you haven't seen them yet and you want to go watch them uh, for yourself or for the ruby frank uh, journal Feel free to go do that as for where i've been i know before i said that i was back when i posted that video and i apologize for that and i know this time i'm gonna be saying the same thing again but i really thought i was back last time but i just wasn't ready youtube requires a lot of time and it was time that i wasn't ready to invest i thought i was ready but i think this time i really am ready this time and i look forward to making a lot more videos and being online more because i took a lot of time off of being online and it felt great but i feel like i'm built up again i can come back better than ever and make amazing videos for everyone out there so thank you for the support and i appreciate you and i will be releasing more behind the scene videos in my discord and for my patreons i plan on connecting more with you guys and just putting as much value as i can out there for everybody so thank you for being here and being part of this community and I'll see you in the next one. And I, I promise. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching.